I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish His purposes on earth. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their Savior. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to people in need. I believe everything I am and everything I own belongs to God. I believe there is a heaven and a hell, and that Jesus will return to judge all people and to establish his eternal kingdom. Well, good morning. We're on this journey to become like Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. And we've been learning if we're going to become like Jesus, we first have to think like Jesus. So we've been exploring the worldview of Jesus, and we've discovered through Believe and the Scriptures these 10 core beliefs that Jesus operated out of. And we're about 80% of the way through the first leg. Come on, let's hear it. We're making some progress. And we've discovered the first five were about that horizontal relationship with, or horizontal is actually this way, isn't it? <laughs> Vertical. It's early, all right? It's early. Anyone else trying to wake up right now? <laughs> right? Although that was spiritual adrenaline, was it not? Can we thank him one more time? That was so helpful in helping me see Jesus. So back to this, the first five were about our vertical relationship with God and we, we made a turn a couple weeks ago. Now we're talking about the horizontal relationships. And two weeks ago, we asked this question, how is God going to accomplish his purposes on earth? And say it out loud with me. I believe the church is God's primary way to accomplish his purposes on earth. And then we talked about all of humanity and how does God see us was the question. And say it out loud with me. I believe all people are loved by God and need Jesus Christ as their savior. And today we're gonna ask a question that every single disciple of Jesus needs to be able to answer. And it's simply this, what about the poor and injustice? What are Jesus' affections and what are his commitments to the poor? What did he believe? To get at that, I wanna tell you a story. And it's from one of my mentors, uh, Tony Campolo, professor, pastor, uh, provocateur, and he started a nonprofit in Haiti decades ago that has served thousands of needy people there. And at the end of one particularly grueling trip, he was standing on the runway waiting for one of those little planes like the puddle jumpers, you know, to get him back to Florida. And uh, he was surprised a person came up behind him, but it wasn't a passenger. It was actually a woman and she was holding her baby. And Tony said, I could tell immediately that this baby was malnourished to a near fatal condition. The baby's hair was tinted red. That's a sign of, again, total malnutrition. The eyes were crossed because of muscle deterioration. He said the baby was just limp. And somehow this mother had snuck onto the, the tarmac and she held her baby up and she said to Tony, mister, take my baby with you. He said she began to weep and, and she got a little more hysterical. Mister, take my baby with you. And Tony said, I was overcome. I started just backing up. I, I didn't know what to say. Would you know what to say? Mister, take my baby with you. And, and, and Tony said, she was so out of control, I just snapped. And I turned around and I ran to the plane. And I got up and I said to the crew, close the door, close the door, we have to go. And he said, I sat down in my seat and I was traumatized. I, I, I didn't even know what to think or to feel. And he said, as we pulled away, I saw that mother and she collapsed on the tarmac. She was holding her baby like this. Take my baby with you. And he said about halfway back to Florida, looking down at the ocean, he said, I realized who the baby was. Jesus. Why would he say that? Well, read this out loud with me. I tell you the truth, whatever you did for one of the least brothers of mine, you did for me. And of course, the opposite is true. The next verse, let's read this out loud together. He will reply, truly I tell you, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Jesus so 
loves the poor, that he completely identifies with them. He says, what you do for them, you do for me. What you don't do for them, you have not done for me. And Jesus' heart is so large. It is so expansive. It is so able to care completely with a totality of kindness and compassion for every single needy person. Isn't that amazing? And here's, here's my challenge. I'm not like that at all. Anyone else? I, I mean, honestly, a lot of days, you know who I'm like? I'm like this guy right here. You recognize him? The Grinch. And one of my favorite scenes in the movie is when they put an x-ray on his heart. And you remember? It was like so tiny, like a little piece of coal. But then there's that moment where he crosses over and he experiences compassion. And do you remember how many sizes did his heart grow? You tell me. Three, Three right. Boom, 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 boom. And in the last shot, it's literally coming out of his chest. And see, that's the journey Jesus wants to take all of us on. Look at your neighbor and say, you know, you look a little bit like the Grinch. Just let him know. <laughs> tell him. You look a little bit like this guy, right? It's early. <laughs> And Jesus wants to take us on a journey where our heart doom, 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 becomes like his. And it's literally coming out of our chest and spilling into acts of kindness and compassion. And that heart for God is so clearly communicated in this week's Bible verse from Psalm 82, verses three and four. Let's say it out loud together. Defend the weak and the fatherless. Uphold the cause of the poor and the oppressed. Rescue the weak and the needy. And I love this last line. Deliver them from the hand of the wicked. That's a call to action. And this theme is something that emerges over and over and over again in the scriptures. Write it down. There are 35 passages. 35 that are about being the champion for the orphan. And if you pull the camera back, there's more than 2,000 passages of scripture about being a champion for the poor and the oppressed. Over and over again, God says, I am the champion for the orphan and the underdog. And my people, they will be champions for the orphan and the underdog. This is not a, a subtext. This is one of the primary themes that runs through the story. And it's summarized today in this key idea. And if you memorized it, say it with me. I believe God calls all Christians to show compassion to those in need. And today, I wanna to invite you to go on a journey. I call it the continuum of compassion. You see, Jesus always starts at the same place with each one of us. He meets us where we are. Aren't you glad he does that? But then he invites you out on mission to uncharted territories, to a place of risk and adventure and transformation. And today, I'm going to walk through this continuum of compassion. It's the compassion journey. And I wanna ask you just to be real honest and look at yourself and say, where am I at on this continuum? And here's the journey, you can write this down. The continuum of compassion begins with involvement and moves towards identification. It begins with involvement. And maybe the clearest picture of involvement when it comes to compassion that we get in the scriptures is the story of the Good Samaritan. It was a part of our Bible reading this week. But the danger with that story is that it's so familiar to us that it can become like wallpaper, you barely notice it anymore. And, and we've lost the scandal. So with your permission, I'm going to retell the story the way I think Jesus might tell it if he was in our context today. Are you in? Okay, so there's a man who lives in Lenexa. And he's gonna head to Excelsior Springs to the Elm Spa and Hotel. He's going to go to a snooty conference and get a massage. Well, he goes the direct route, which takes him right through Casey Moe. And he ends up at the corner of independence and prospect. What most people believe is the most dangerous spot in all of Kansas City. And according to the Kansas City Star earlier this year, 
KC Mo had the ignoble designation of being the highest murder rate of African American males in our country. And may we weep. When he gets to independence and prospect, guess what? He's carjacked. He's pulled out of that car. He's beaten. He's left for dead. Now, a little while later, this handsome, young, intelligent pastor <laughs> comes driving along in his yellow Jeep, and he sees this guy, and he says to himself, this is clearly a setup. So he puts it in four-wheel drive and pulls out of there as fast as he can. And then shortly thereafter, another pastor comes along who's much, much, much older than the first pastor. His name rhymes with Andy. And he pulls up in his convertible and he sees this guy and he says, I'm rolling all the stops because I believe I'm gonna get out of here. That's the 11th belief, by the way. We're coming to that one later. So he takes off, crosses over, drives away. Now this next part of the story, you get to be the story writer. You get to make up the next part of the story. I want you to think about who, who are the people or what's the category of people that you are most tempted to hate? That just, if you're honest about it, they're the kind of people that just are repulsive to you. See, maybe for some of you, this needs to be the story of the good Islamic terrorist, a card-carrying member of Al-Qaeda who's actually beheaded people. Maybe for some of you, it needs to be the story of the, the good white supremacist who happens to be the grand wizard of the KKK. See, the amount of ethnic hatred in the original context, in the word Samaritan, is hard for us to underestimate. The people that Jesus was speaking to in that original context, the Samaritan was considered a non-person. They were absolutely despised. It would have been so offensive to them. So that's the person, that person. First of all, they, they see something, then they feel something, then they do something. There's this person that they, they see it, and then they feel it. And then they do it. They go on this journey. And the Samaritans' involvement, there are these three different stages. And I want us to walk through those together. So read out loud with me here, Luke verse 10, verse 33, because we're going to find the first couple stages in this one verse. Let's read it together. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. Here's involvement step number one. Stop, notice, and come near. Stop, notice, and come near. In the case of the other religious leader, Jesus was very careful to say of both of them that they crossed over to the far side of the road. Now, there's this category of jokes about the chicken crossing the road, right? You know what I'm talking about? And everybody in this room probably has one of those jokes, right? Why did the chicken cross the road? Here's mine, to avoid lame jokes, right? <laughs> and you've probably got one too. So in this passage, it's like, why did the religious leaders cross the road? Because they were chickens. <laughs> it was about self-preservation. And what's shocking about this passage here and what Jesus is trying to bring to our attention is, I mean, these are the religious leaders. I mean, these are the people that represent the church. They're the paid professionals. I mean, these are the very ones who should step up to the plate, but they aren't. Why? Because of self-preservation, because of fear. And that is the opposite of compassion. It's this scarcity mindset. And, and the first step in compassion is proximity. We must get near to those who are in need, those that are hurting, those that are lost. And we live in a world that tells us to separate ourselves, to set up a big buffer or a moat between us and need. And there's this instinctual response when we see need. Many times there's this sense of fear and guardedness. It's, it's like when you pull up to that corner and the guy's there with the will work for food sign. It's like, don't make eye contact, don't make eye contact. Don't make eye contact. Because if you do, 
you know you're gonna confront his humanity. And that begins to make a demand on your heart. And the first thing the Good Samaritan does is he looks the will, will, will work for food sign guy in the eyes. And he moves near. So here's the question, where do you start? Where do you start the compassion journey? Wherever you are, wherever you are. The place the Good Samaritan started, it was right where he was. He didn't even go like on a special mission trip or anything. He didn't even go and volunteer at the soup kitchen. It was literally the person God put right in front of him. And what I'm telling you is this week, as you are on your journey, you are going to confront need. It might be on the news or in the newspaper. It might be in your neighborhood. It might be in your workplace. It might come up in a surprising way. And at that moment, it's the invitation. It's the beginning of the compassion journey. Not to avoid it. Not to set up the wall. Not to you know, put a moat in there. But to actually move towards the need. And this morning, there is a need that is going to cross your path. You probably noticed the Christmas trees when you came in here. And on those Christmas trees, there are tags. And they represent children that are in the foster care system who are so vulnerable. And we've had a tradition for many years here. We wanna make sure every single kid in foster care around us has a great Christmas. Amen? Amen. So they know they matter to Jesus. And they matter to Jesus' people. And then also we understand that social workers are their advocates, that they, they spend long hours with overwhelming caseloads, that they are underpaid, and they are God's agents. They are their first line of defense. They're like police officers or firefighters. They're first responders. They're heroes. And we want to make sure they know that as God's people, we think they're heroes. We value them. So there's tags for social workers to do something a little special for them this Christmas. And you know what's crazy? It was five years ago this weekend that Michelle and I and our girls visited this congregation for the first time. And when we saw your response at the end of that service, it was like the inmates were loose at the, at the, the prison. Like you guys, ah! you ran out of here and you stripped the trees down. And we literally wept. We were so moved by the heart of compassion. And, and, and over the last 10 years in this church family, there's been this growing passion for the orphan and the underdog, for the spiritual and the physical orphan. And hundreds of you have stepped up. You've stepped into foster care or adoption or supporting families that are doing adoption and foster care. Hundreds of you have stepped up, engaged regular acts of compassion in our city. And as your big brother, I wanna say, well done. Well done. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. We don't turn away, we stop, we notice, we engage. And that leads to the second step. And let's read the verse again because I want you to notice this, okay? 10, verse 33. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he was moved with compassion. And this is involvement stage two, be moved with compassion. See, the Samaritan stopped and noticed and came near, and then something began to grow in him. See, he, he did something, he stopped, but then he started to feel something. And this compassion began to well up in him. And Jesus uses a very strong word in the original language. In the Greek, it's splachnomi, splachnizomai. It's kind of a hard word to say. Splachnizomai. And this word occurs many times in the Gospels. In fact, write this down. There are approximately 24 specific unique events where Jesus' emotions are explicitly recorded. The emotion Jesus is described as having the most, guess what it is? Compassion. Spock nizomai. And that word splunk, it's actually the Greek word for guts. In other words, when it says Jesus felt compassion, it means his guts were twisted. It's this emotional earthquake at the tectonic level of the soul where he feels this deep, the deepest empathy anyone could ever feel, the deepest sense of affection anyone has ever felt. That when it says Jesus felt compassion, that's, is, that's what's going on in the deepest place of his soul. And one of my heroes, Brendan Manning, describes the power of that with such vivid language. I want you to let this just roll over you and sink in. 
When you read in the Gospels that Jesus was moved with compassion, it is saying that his gut was wrenched, his heart was torn open, and the most vulnerable part of his being laid bare. The ground of all being shook. The source of all life trembled. The heart of all love burst open, and the unfathomable depths of relentless tenderness was laid bare. Your Christian life and mine don't make any sense unless in the depth of our beings we believe that Jesus not only knows what hurts us, but knowing seeks us out, whatever our poverty, whatever our pain. His plea to his people is, come now wounded, frightened, angry, lonely, empty, and I'll meet you where you live. And I'll love you as you are, not as you should be, because you're never gonna be as you should be. Do you really believe this? And as I receive Jesus' compassion for me, I will instinctively begin to release Jesus' compassion for others. And here's why. When we understand that we were spiritual orphans, that we needed rescue and adoption, I mean, yeah, come on, we clean up pretty good in this room, we're pretty good at image management, but let's be honest, behind closed doors, spiritually, we all know we've made a mess of our lives, we've made a wreck of it, that we are rebellious ragamuffins who are victims of our own demise, and Jesus didn't stand off at a distance, God came in Jesus, and he plunged himself into our need, our poverty, our sin, our brokenness, he left his riches to enter our poverty so that we could be rich. And he cupped his hand around our chin and he lifted our eyes and he said, you're mine. You belong to me. And he gave us every spiritual blessing. We are, we are so stinking rich in Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen? And it wasn't because we deserved it. It's because he is good. When you open your heart and begin to just dive into the oceanic depths of Jesus' compassion, you can't help but then open up your hands and give it to someone else. So here's the thing, when you stop at the tag today, don't make it like this quick fix, like a, a, a guilt relief valve where you just grab the tag and say, I'm gonna get that present and get this done so I can kind of get it over with, right? Like actually open your heart and remember that you were an orphan who was rescued. And how did Jesus treat you? And then remember Jesus said, love your neighbors yourself. How would you want to be treated if you were one of those kids? <clears throat> then do that. And, and, and use your sacred imagination to put yourself in their shoes. That's what the Good Samaritan did. Not only did he cross over, he opened his heart to be moved with compassion. And if you do those two things, that's gonna lead you to, to stage number three, okay? And it's pretty simple. Do something. <laughs> Just do something. And you remember what the Good Samaritan did, right? He, he, he bandaged the guy up, put him in the hostel for a couple days, gave him the credit card, said, put it on my tab, right? Now, here's what's amazing about that. Here, here's what's interesting about it, is that he just did a few acts of compassion, a few. What I find interesting in this story is actually the restraint that Jesus uses. Like, for example, he didn't do brain surgery, right? He bandaged him up. The guy didn't even cancel his business trip, right? He just kept going. He, he didn't buy the guy a condo, start a new nonprofit for, for all mugging victims on the road, and then provide you know, annual trips to Disney World, <laughs> right? What did he do? He's like, hey, here's some money, cover him for the weekend and make sure he's better. Isn't that cool? Be, Jesus is saying, do something. And here's what I want you to write down. I don't have to do everything, I just need to do something. And that's where involvement begins. And sometimes it can be overwhelming. The vast need can become a primary obstacle because we feel like the needs are so vast and what I would contribute is so small, but Jesus says, do something. And in fact, Larry Ward, who's a huge advocate, who has worked to fight hunger in Africa for many, many years, when he was encountering his first famine, he was completely immobilized by the sheer immensity of all the children starving and overwhelmed and in despair, he prayed. What can I do, God? <coughs> and he heard in his spirit, Larry, they die one at a time. They can be saved one at a time. 
And if all of us do something, and if you did something over a lifetime, do you realize how huge the accumulated impact would be? It'd be amazing. And see, this is the opportunity we have today to not just jet out of here and cross over, but to stop. And all of us can do something. And together it's gonna be this massive wave, this holiday season here in our neck of the woods. And see, as you move down this continuum where you stop and you notice and you move near and then you're moved with compassion and then you do something and you begin to do something regularly, you're gonna find something happening to you. You'll move to what I'm calling identification. You move from involvement to identification. And again, back in this passage, back in Matthew 25, let me read these words to you. Then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Jesus here is so identified with the poor and the needy. He says, I am one with them. And as God's people, we follow Jesus' example. We begin with involvement, but eventually he wants us to move to this place called identification, where we begin to live alongside the poor and the needy, where they become our friends, and even better, our family. And of course, Jesus is the fullest expression of this kind of missionary engagement. In John 1.14, it says this, the word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. Isn't that great? In other words, Jesus didn't send an email offering salvation. Jesus didn't come down from heaven and volunteer for a few hours and then head back up. He moved into the neighborhood. He became one of us. He lived with us. He loved us. He served us. He suffered with us. He died for us and he redeemed us. And now he invites his people to do what he did. And you can write this down. Jesus calls us all to identification and that's a lifestyle as one of. Now, this looks different for different people. You know, the place God has called our family to live this out has always been in our neighborhood. And then also, in particularly, in India. And we've invested so much time and in, in resources in both of those places to meet the need in those places. And God calls every single one of his followers to a particular pocket of people to engage the need there, to be one of. And again, this looks different for different people but you begin to build this rhythm of service and compassion where you're steadily investing into a particular pocket of people, the compassion God is growing in your heart. And I wanna share with you a story today of what that looks like, going from involvement to identification. And I'm gonna invite Jen Decker, our leader of Network 127, to come up and share that story. Will you welcome Jen as she comes on up? Hello. Hey, Jen. Hey. So first of all, uh, Network 127, what is that? Network 127 is a ministry we have here for foster and adoptive parents, and it started out to serve foster adoptive parents in our community, but it's grown into an outreach to local agencies and to networking with other churches to really address the needs in our community. That's awesome. And what is the 127 stand Oh, that's for? after James 127 that says, pure and faultless religion is to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being defiled by the world. Amen. 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 So every year we have this great tradition, yep. the Christmas tree. Unpack that a little bit. What's gonna happen with those tags? And, what, and what's our role to play? Well, you already talked about it a little bit, so I spent a lot of time on it, but we purchase gifts for children um, who are currently in foster care. We also purchase gift cards for kids who come into foster care between now and Christmas, and it's a lot. Um, we have families in our church that took in five kids this weekend that all came in wow. over the weekend. Wow. So. It happens on the regular. So those kids aren't represented on the tree and we'd like to get them something too. But we also bless social workers and we're gonna have some other opportunities this year too. I know you have uh, a dream this year. You're calling it go beyond the gift or yeah. go beyond the tag. Yeah. Um, what do you mean by that? Well, I think some of us get this tag and we wrestle, we look at this name and we think, this kid probably needs more than a new Lego kit. 
but mm -hmm. we don't know what to do with that tension we feel, so we, we buy the Lego kit, and we're gonna talk about some of the other opportunities. And actually, there's a story I wanna tell about a family who just has been steadily getting into a rhythm and finding their rhythm in their next yeah, steps. Why don't you share that with us? Um, I wanna tell you about a family that we have here in our congregation. Their names are Robert and Crystal Pierce, and they have three boys. We have a picture of them. Um, we did have a, there, there they there are. They are. Um, and they've just been steadily walking this out. They actually shared a letter with me kind of about their journey, and I'm not gonna read you the whole thing, but I do wanna share their story. Um, you know, for them, it started with a gift tag, and it started with hearing about orphans and children in foster care over and over again here at Westside. And just that, they described it as kind of a gnawing feeling that mm -hmm. there's more to this for us, there's more to this for us. But they looked at their three busy kids and thought, we, we don't know what that is. Um, but they kind of followed that feeling and realized it was the Holy Spirit leading them and they just started doing the next thing. So they started to provide respite care, which is taking kiddos into your home um, who are currently in foster care. It's not like with your kids where if you're going, you and Michelle are going out of town, you just leave them at the neighbor's house. These kids are in the care of the state, so they need to go to another licensed family. So mm -hmm. we really need those relief families. So they started doing that and after having kids in their home, they realized, well, we can make ourselves a little bit more available. So they started taking kids in for emergency placements. So this is before a kid even enters foster care. They're removed from a dangerous situation by the police department and they need to go somewhere until it's figured out they need to go to foster care, go back home. So they've been staying, um, they've been taking in several kids through that. And then they started realizing these kids don't come with what they need. Mm. Um, underwear, pajamas, socks, toothbrushes, and it's 11.30 at night, and what am I gonna do? So they connected with a local clothing closet at another church, another church that we network with, and they even got the keys, and they provide orga um, some organization and some volunteers, and they have a way to dispatch people so that they can go and drop off what you need at 11 o'clock at night if you take in a so kiddo. Cool. So they just started following um, next steps. And through the kids who come in their home, once you've come into their home, you're known to them. They, they, they can't, you're not just a name on a tag anymore. So they need to know where you go and how they can support you. So um, Crystal learned about becoming an educational advocate so she could go sit in IEP meetings for kids. Because when you're getting shuffled around, you don't have anyone looking out for your education. But there are two things they said in the letter that I really want to read that really stuck with me. The first is, are kids getting the opportunity to serve other kids going in and out of very tough situations, getting involved in foster care and foster care ministry is one of the best things we could have ever done for our kids, which I thought was neat. It's real, it's hard, and sometimes it's real hard. Our family gets to be a part of God's plan, and that's something they wouldn't have, wouldn't have been able to experience if we hadn't have said yes. It's such an amazing story of starting with involvement. They yeah. stopped. Mm -hmm. They noticed, yeah, and then this regular cycle of involvement, and now there's kids that are like embedded into their lives. Absolutely, and they've involved their community, they've involved their neighbors, yeah. they've involved their extended family, and just being a part of the network that now cares about this kid, this kid who had no one to care about right. them before. Um, it's amazing, and one thing she also said is she was sitting in an IEP meeting that she wrote in the letter, um, is she heard about all the issues the student was having and thinking about all the places where the student had been failed by the system and by adults. And she said, the church is the only answer for the problem of the almost 7,600 kids in foster care within the state of Kansas. Um, and the reason I wanna share this story, it's not because the Pierces are superheroes. In fact, they didn't start doing six things all at once, but they just did the next thing. Mm -hmm. And they saw the need and figured out the way that fit for them to respond to it. So this year, we're doing a little something different with the trees because we want to help families identify that gnawing feeling mm -hmm. that there are next step opportunities and not all of them are fostering full time or adopting full time, but God might be asking some of you to do that. We need it, mm -hmm. but there's opportunities to become a court advocate for a child, to become an educational advocate for a child, to mentor a youth aging out of foster care, mm -hmm. to prepare meals for families, to be a part of that resourcing team. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, there's a lot, and we're gonna help Westsiders find their next steps in that. That's beautiful. So notice a couple things here. First of all, especially for the parents in the room, I know you have a deep desire for your, for your kids to be people of compassion and generosity someday. 
Mm -hmm. But here's the thing. Robert and Crystal, they didn't tell their kids. They showed their kids. And, and I just want to encourage you as a parent, show, don't tell. Invite your kids into this compassion journey with you, and they will be changed as you are changed. And here's the next thing. We all can do something. Amen? Mm -hmm. And we've got an opportunity today. On the way out, I encourage you to stop at the tree and notice. Be moved with compassion. And then do something. And then be open to discover that maybe there's something else to do next. And there will be a gathering. Yeah, there's a you gathering. Want to explain that? There's a tag on the tree that just talks about all the different ways. It's gray. It's the only one that's gray. So you can take a look at it. Give us your name and email. We will follow up and help you connect with those opportunities. And then we're having an event on November 15th where all the different agencies I talked about that provide those different things are here. You can come. You might think you want to hear about taking meals and you might hear about mentoring and think, oh no, I want to do that. So we're gonna give you this opportunity to come and hear from the different agencies and make connections so you can just start making next steps. So let's stand to our feet. And you're about to head out, so don't cross over. And may you be the people of God who stop, notice, are moved by compassion, and do something. And all God's people said? Amen. Amen. Go in grace and peace. Thank you for joining us for this message from Westside Family Church. We're on a journey of discovering how to think, act, and be more like Jesus. If you've been impacted by what God is doing through the Believe journey, we'd love to hear from you. Share your story at westsidefamily.church forward slash we believe. These stories are incredibly encouraging to both our staff and our church family. If you'd like to invest in what God is doing through Westside, you can give online at westsidefamily.church forward slash give. Thank you so much for watching.